I'm Peter R. Bregan, MD, and I am a psychiatrist, and the subject today is the suicidally depressed person. And it is number five in my series of uh, simple truths about psychiatry. In some of the earlier presentations, I talked a lot about the problems with using drugs, and I'm going to talk more about that in more detail in later presentations. But I'm taking a break to talk about more positive things. And my previous presentation, number four, was about dealing with the very disturbed person who gets labeled schizophrenic and helping them. And this time, I'm going to talk about another really frightening experience, which is the suicidal patient. And let me say that I've been doing um, psychotherapy since 1968. For most of my life, I've had a very full practice of like 30 hours, 35 hours a week, which is many more patients than that because I often see couples and families. Then I moved up here to live in upstate New York. I live on a lake. Um, it's where we are right now. And I've been here for 10 years, and I do about half that many patients a week. And many people would consider that still a full practice. And during this entire time, I've never had a suicide in my practice. Now, one could attribute that in part to doing good therapy, but I think very good therapists could have suicides in their practice even more than one, so I think some of it is luck. Sometimes I feel protected in my reform work. But I think another big reason is, is that I never give psychiatric drugs to people for their problems. I don't start people on drugs. So if you come to me feeling suicidal, I don't give you a drug. Why would I give you an antidepressant when it's got a big box warning on it that up to age 24 you even see an increased suicide rate on antidepressants in controlled clinical trials? And then we got lots of other studies showing that, as you might expect, the suicide rates also increased in older people. Why would I want to give a drug that has a, lots of warnings about worsening your condition to somebody whose condition's already worse? So what is the answer? to being so depressed you want to kill yourself. When I talked about psychosis, I talked about the breakdown of the fabric of all the connections to human beings so that you end up in a state that looks crazy and nightmarish. In depression, what happens is there's a total loss of hope. Hope. What keeps us going? Why do we get up in the morning? Well, we expect to live. We have hopes of doing something worthwhile. We think we have a future. But when your internal conflicts or the effects of your childhood or the stresses in your marriage or the loss of loved ones or the loss of hope for a wonderful life and career, when hope fails, that's when we fall back into depression. So, what's the answer? to depression from the viewpoint of a therapist. Well, the most important thing is to be hopeful. You want to be a really hopeful, hopeful therapist. Just like if you're dealing with a person who's lost their social fabric and can't connect and is distrustful, you want to be a really connecting therapist. In this case, you want to be connecting and really hopeful to overcome the loss of hope. And we know that that's just about the only factor in mental health that we can point to and say it reduces the suicide rate. That is rapport. That's the more technical term, but I don't like that at all. I like the straightforward, a hopeful person. Now, if you go to a psychiatrist <clears throat> and you tell him, I feel so horrible, I feel like my body's rotting, I feel like there's something wrong in my brain, it's hopeless, and the psychiatrist says, well, there is something wrong in your brain. You have a biochemical imbalance. Is that hopeful? Does that give you the sense of, I can triumph. It's in my hands. I can turn my life around. I can stop thinking of compromising. I can stop thinking of what I really want to do. I can actually dare love. I can dare stand up for myself. I can dare maybe even change my work. Maybe even become more spiritual. Maybe find God. That's not what you hear. 
And does your average psychiatrist look hopeful? Huh? Go to an American Psychiatric Association meeting. Uh-uh. Because people who give drugs and diagnose people, they, they become unhappy people. They're not hopeful people. And can you be hopeful during a 10-minute med check? Of course not. So the most fundamental thing for helping the really depressed and suicidal person is to build a hopeful relationship. You find their strengths, you find their dreams, you help them discover what they really want to do with their lives. And as in much of the work I do, I find that if there is a family that this person wants to be in and wants to have a life with, then you work with the whole family. And you, t you help them love. You help them get that love out that's been buried by the anger and the rage and the fighting and the disappointment. You help all the members of the family begin to think not only about themselves but each other and also better about themselves, about their own qualities to love and to create and to be responsible and to take charge of life. So you can work with the whole family in that regard or with the couple, with the husband and wife, with the kids coming in once in a while, get a little dose of hopefulness. You can also do the more therapeutic things because sometimes you'll find the person's been depressed all their lives. It's not some acute situation. Quite often it's all their lives. And then it's easy to explain. If you've been depressed your whole life, we need to go back and see where you lost hope as a child. And you'll be surprised how quickly people can begin to discover where they lost hope with the alcoholic father, the absent mother the bullying in school, the feeling humiliated about being gay, whatever it is. It's not hard, usually, to go back and get some semblance of what was going on. And then you work with that and you explain, well, those terrible lessons of hopelessness and just deciding you weren't going to wish for anything, you weren't going to want anything, and if you did want something, it would be taken away. We can change that now that you're an adult. You can begin to think, whoa, I can only get what I seek. I can only enjoy life if I'm doing things I want and love to do. I have to take charge of all of that. Now, this is pretty simple stuff I'm describing. It's not the whole picture. It's not the whole story. But I do want to let you know that if you're suicidally depressed, it's a good sign. It's a good sign. Why? Because you're full of feeling. The extent to which you hate yourself and you want to die reflects another vision that you must have that's led to your disappointment. I'm more concerned about the person who comes in without feelings. That's one another reason why I don't want to give people drugs so they don't have feelings. But the person who is suicidally depressed and really wants to die invariably is a passionate person with a huge capacity for life that's been thwarted and inhibited and distorted by life and by bad decisions and by giving up. So I welcome suicidal thoughts. I don't try to drug them away. I welcome and say, all right, let's look at why you would want to die. What are you missing? What do you imagine you could have? What have you lost? What's going on inside you that's such a conflict that you can't move forward? Welcome your feelings. Your feelings are your signals, and not your answers, but they're your signals of how to go and where to go and where to take your life. And have lots of hope because it's in your hands to find out how you want to live and to do it as nearly that way as you possibly can. Thanks.